IES is best described as a digital signage system for broadcast. Um, what that means is we can do everything a digital signage system can do, but there are real broadcast uh, elements to it. Um, it's a completely IP-based IP uh, solution, um, and it's made up out of connected devices. In most cases, it's a screen, like we have this uh, television here, which has become an IDS connected device, or we have a, a touch screen uh, control interface here, which has become uh, an IDS connected device. Um, any screen with an HDMI input can become a connected device through one of those little uh, IDS uh, remoras. We call them remoras, so the sucking fish you see in the, in the tank. Uh, and basically that gets bolted to the back of the TV, HDMI cable from the remora into the TV, and then IP in, and you're done. So it's a very, very flexible uh, system like that, and exactly the same way uh, with a touch screen. Um, we have a whole range of other things we can call connected devices, uh, like I.O. boxes, control boxes, and so on, but I'll go into that in a bit more detail uh, later. Uh, at the heart of an IDS system, uh, we have a core, which is in essence uh, a little server um, that allows you to configure, manage all of the uh, connected devices, uh, as well as act as an interface to those connected devices uh, if you want to talk to third party devices uh, like uh, a new system or an automation system or a control system or whatever uh, that may be. Um, I mentioned digital signage for broadcast. Um, why broadcast and what that really means uh, is that an IDS system in a traditional broadcast would replace studio clocks, one of the key features. We have a studio clock here on the screen. Uh, typically, studio clocks, a standalone clock, is um, you know, connected to power, but it has a, an LTC, a time code, uh, input in order to keep it synchronized with the rest uh, of the facility. Uh, we don't need to use uh, time code here. We use NTP, Network Time Protocol, uh, which basically just lives uh, on the network. So everything is just synchronized across the network over standard uh, IP uh, connection. So studio clocks, uh, a very important one. Uh, another one we see here is Q lamps, study lamps. So my client on air, um, you know, who's talking next, radio shows, all of that, those kind of. Uh, things. So we can again bring that together on a single uh, connected device. Uh, an important part is that we also still have standalone uh, table lamps or wall lamps. They're RGB, LED powered devices, single IP connection, power over Ethernet, so it allows us to integrate them within the IDS system. So if you, all you want is one tally lamp, you don't have to put a whole screen up, you can just have a wall lamp or a table lamp for radio studios. So, studio clocks and cue lamps. Um, we have two production timers there on the screen, label number one and two in this case. So, we can also uh, perform all the functions you'll find in traditional production timers, whereas the old Leach Harris style uh, production timers. So, we can do up and down counting. I'll do a quick uh, one there later. But again, a very, very powerful feature that's fully implemented uh, within this uh, system. Clearly, on a system, if it goes across different studios and so on, you can have multiple uh, production timers, one, one per studio or gallery or whichever way you want to work. So it's not just limited to one as it would be with a hardware-based uh, solution. Um, those are the, the key kind of features it all started with, but since then we've had a things like uh, news arrival screens. So if you want to interface with Avid iNews or Interplay, we can bring in that information and display that to the journalists within a newsroom so they can uh, you know, get all of this information where before they would have to log on just by looking at a big 50 inch TV or screen hanging uh, within the facility. So uh, also scheduling systems. So if you want to be able to visualize a schedule in big across the whole facility, you can interface with those. Uh, and also automation systems. So if you want to see the playlist, where you are in the playlist, uh, how much is left to go on a certain piece, so again, so it's about displaying a wide range of broadcast specific information from clocks, production timers, tally lamps, but also arrivals boards, information lists, uh, scheduling lists, uh, etc. Um, so those are the broadcast specific parts of the system. So that's really how we start by getting it into uh, a facility. So we're looking at production areas, galleries, uh, and so on. 
because it's also digital signage, there is a whole other element to this that can be integrated at the same time. Here, for example, I'm playing some video. We can display images. Uh, and all of this can be dynamically changed uh, and updated. So it also is very suited to having uh, screens like this outside of production areas, uh, studios, uh, and galleries. Um, so people can get a feel for what's happening within that studio. Are they on the air? So better stay out. Is the mic live for a radio studio? Better not walk in or uh, stuff like that. Um, but also what production is going on? So maybe you can get that from the scheduling system so you can see what production is going on within that facility or what production is coming next and at what time it will start, uh, contact details and so on. In a lot of broadcast facilities, when you walk through the facility, you'll see little plastic folders or little wallets on the side of the door and then someone has to fill in a piece of paper every day and run around and stick it in there. Yes, the piece of paper and the plastic wallet is very cheap, but the time of people actually spend putting that information in there, make sure it's up to date, um, you know, the errors that can creep in is actually very, very costly. So we can really help with that and you can manage all that content from a, from a single uh, point. Uh, and I'll get a bit more information on how you manage that uh, later. Uh, another very important area is branding. Um, you know, a lot of uh, studios are used for a wide range of programs. Yeah? So it might be one program this day, another program the next, or even from morning to afternoon. Uh, it might even be used by multiple uh, TV or radio stations. You know, you, uh, for example, IMG in the UK uh, is an independent uh, production uh, facility. So people like BBC or FIFA or whoever can just rent this space, come in and you know, uh, produce a show. Uh, so what the branding aspect of IDS allows you to do is to rebrand the whole studio as if you are in a FIFA studio or you are in a BBC uh, studio. So uh, an example of how this is widely used is in BBC radio studios uh, in London. Um, those radio studios are shared between lots of the, the different BBC radio stations. And the first thing a production assistant will do when they come into the room to set up for a radio show is they will hit the branding button on the control screen that allows them to rebrand the whole studio, including the dressing rooms, the green rooms, uh, any live areas connected to this to be Radio 1 or Radio 4 or 6 Music or whatever might be going on. So branding is a very, very important uh, area of this. Um, I'll do a quick demo so you can see how uh, the whole thing interacts. So we have one Remora here on this connected screen, so that's our main screen, and then we have one touch screen here that allows us to uh, interact uh, with uh, the system. So clearly we have time, and as you can see, they're perfectly synchronized uh, using uh, NTP, and information such as uh, dates and stuff are also uh, you know, readily available within the system as part of this NTP synchronization uh, packages. Um, the clock, we can change it to any style. Here it's set up so I can go between a, a digital readout clock uh, or a typical analog clock. And I can interface with that screen by just you know, pressing the clock with one of the functionalities. Uh, a very useful uh, feature as well is offset time. Yeah, so we have an offset time uh, panel here. So if I want to pretend it's 12 o'clock, middle of the day, it's uh, the 1st of September in 2013. Not normally go back in time, but if you wanted to, and I want this to be the case for the next six or seven seconds, and I press start, the clock now glows blue, and for the next seven seconds, it will be that time and that uh, date. So it's a very, very flexible tool if you're doing off-air productions before you know the actual uh, date that, that it will actually be uh, aired in. So very, very flexible there. Q lamps or tally lamps, we have things like Might Live on air. In this case, I'm pressing the button, which is making the live uh, active. Uh, but clearly, we can integrate. Yeah? So if, for example, you have a GPIO or a GPO coming out of your uh, mixing console to say when you're, you have mic live, we can then feed that into the system, and that would then turn on the light rather than me pressing the button. Likewise, if your on-air system, uh, on-air light comes from your broadcast control system, again, we can interface with that either through GPIO or if more integration is required through third-party device uh, drivers. So we can really uh, bring all of that uh, together. The 
production timer. It's a very powerful feature. It's it's there out of the box. You buy an IDS system, the production timer is, is, is a, you know, already part of that. So it's just something that's configured within software to either be displayed uh, or not. Anyone use the production timer will be a very, uh, you know, kind of typical interface. We select which timer we want to set. Say we want an up time. In this case, it's 10 seconds. You might a bit longer. Start, and we now get an up timer for 10 seconds. Likewise, I can have a down timer. Again, maybe for 10 seconds, and off it goes. Uh, in this case, there are two software program, but if you want four production timers, three production timers, you know, because it's also in software, it's a very, very flexible way of working. Also, if you have specific requirements out of your production timer, maybe you want one button that always resets the counter, but automatically continues to count from zero again, that can all occur because it's all software driven. So we can really, uh, you know, configure that to suit your exact needs as uh, a broadcaster. One more thing about the production timer, actually two more things. Uh, we do have time code input and output interfaces. So it's a little, uh, little small box with uh, IP on one end, power over Ethernet, so you don't even have to supply separate power. And then there's either a dual time code in or a dual time code out. What that means, dual time code in, if you already have a production timer, you can just display it on the screens with a dual time code out. You can actually take those time codes and send them to typical digital readouts you might already have within the facility. So you can still work uh, backward or forward compatible with legacy uh, production timer systems. We also have a very nice uh, implementation of uh, infrared control. Again, like the time code interfaces, we have a small box, uh, IP with PoE, power over Ethernet on one side, and then we have up to four uh, infrared outputs, so the typical little sensors with the little ones you just stick on the infrared sensor of the TV, set-top box, whatever you want to control, uh, and that's then available in the system. It's four per little box, but you can have as many boxes as you want. So if you want to control 40 devices, you just have 10 of those boxes uh, on your network, and they are then available within that. Uh, we've implemented here a, a typical TV uh, remote control, this is completely configurable. So if all you need to do is turn things on or off or switch between two certain channels, you can make them buttons with the logo of that channel. Uh, one button press could turn 50 TVs on or off, you know, so you can really be creative. You can create all sorts of different logic macro blocks that will allow you to do a wide range of uh, different uh, things. So it's, again, you can use your imagination what you do with this infrared uh, information. We mentioned branding, in this case here on the screen, we're showing uh, a video, and it's very easy to interact with this video. So in here I've got 10 thumbnails with uh, different video streams on them, and by selecting that thumbnail, that will then start playing that relevant uh, video uh, on the screen. Um, a screen is not static, so a, a screen could have different layouts. In this case, we only have two, but if I press the full screen button, I will now be playing that video in full screen. So uh, this could be, for example, a little IPTV setup. This could be branding images uh, like we have here. They're just little branding clips. They could be still images, a logo of a TV station or a TV program. So very, very uh, flexible. Um, a little bit of extra information about uh, the video it can display. There are two main ways of doing it. The way we have implemented it here because it's a closed little network is we have ingested 10 different little video clips they get ingested and transcoded onto the server. They will then be available in the server in three formats, um, a thumbnail, which is what this is, so very low bandwidth uh, across the network, uh, half size and full size. Yeah, so you can then show, you know, that would be half size, and when we're calling this, that's actually uh, the full size clip uh, being called. Um, so that's one way we ingest video. So if you have a clip about your broadcast that's playing in a lobby, that would just be ingested and it would just loop and loop. Uh, and it's easy to upgrade, update it if you have a new video or a new logo. Uh, the second one is you can actually have an IP feed. So the IP feed could come from an IP camera, that could come from an SD stream being translated into IP, or that could be any IP feed uh, available on a network, whether it's a local network or the internet out there. We support HTTP, RTP, and RTSP streams. We don't support every single codec 
under the sun because there are thousands, but we support the majority. And again, if you have a specific code, if we can look at it for things like Azure P64, MP4s, all of those kind of uh, you know, formats are supported. What we have here is a, a little control of uh, pan tilt zoom uh, cameras. I don't physically have uh, a robotic camera here, uh, but we have uh, interfaces currently for the Sony and the Panasonic range of uh, robotic cameras. Uh, we can control them from here. Again, generally they're IP, so that IP stream can then be shown uh, on, on the file so you can see how it's moving. Uh, great application, for example, here with a little video of a voiceover booth. You, know, you would have one of those little cameras in there so you can see it. Uh, in radio studios when you're doing a crossover from one show to the other so you can actually see the DJ uh, you're talking to um, and clearly uh, most radio stations are also <laughs> a video show these days on, on uh, online and stuff like that so those cameras and the control of them can all be happening from uh, within uh, the IDF system so it makes it a very nice complete uh, system um, one final little demonstration, and again, we haven't got the DMX lighting in here, but we have a DMX lighting controller. Again, it's one of those small little boxes, IP on one end, and a DMX typical uh, connector on the other end, 128 channels. Um, every radio studio, every TV studio, somewhere has a small little DMX lighting controller. You don't really need to use that anymore. If you have an IDS system, you can just implement it in here. Um, we can create all sorts of different presets. We can set our RGB colors and, and intensity, um, but the sky is the limit. You know, there's a lot of different things you can control with DMX, like position of lights and so on. So you can all, all program that here. Uh, typical applications would be um, the light fade in and fade out in the beginning of uh, a new show, for example, generally controlled uh, by uh, DMX. Um, an example in um, a radio studio in the UK, they have a big newsroom, which is a news application, with all the journalists sitting around it, and then in the middle they have a cluster of three actual radio studios, uh, and on the top of them they have DMX controlled lighting, so it's to allow the journalists to interact a bit more with the studios and see what's going on, so when they are on air, they'll glow red, so they know they're on air, don't just walk in there, you know what's coming. Uh, when the mic live, it, it, their mic, mic is live, but it's not actually on air, again, it'll be a different color or it would just be a white when they're just in, a, in an off state, so they, they can really visually see uh, what's uh, going on. Um, so there's a lot of di different things you can do with DMX, from mood lighting to actually studio lighting to actually uh, effects like, uh, like that. Um, so that's some of the examples. Um, you can kind of let your imagination run wide. Uh, there, while there's a very uh, comprehensive logic builder within the system that allows you to set up all sorts of different conditions. If this happens and this happens, then carry out this. And this is fully uh, programmable. Most people, when they see a system like this, uh, expect it to come with four months of engineers on site to try and program that. Uh, so we've made our core as simple as possible to program uh, to allow us to make that as easy as possible and allow also people and system integrators to make changes quickly without having to have real manufacturer support every time you want to make a small change. Um, there are two levels to the core. There is the engineering part of the core, so this is where we lay out the screens, this is where we build the logic map, so how does it behave when this button gets pressed, then do this, etc. Uh, and, and actually managing those devices from firmware updates to sending the correct uh, screens to them. And then there is a more user-friendly version of the core. It's the same core, but it's accessible through any web browser, and that's where you can upload new images, uh, upload RSS feeds, um, you know, scrolling text. Um, you know, you can point it to different URLs or different uh, video feeds, etc., etc. So there's two very distinct levels, uh, which is great because it means once it's set up, and for that you need the engineering side of things. You know, a production assistant or anyone who is more creative and more worried about the logos and the branding and the imaging uh, can actually change that themselves without really needing uh, engineering support. What we ha have here is a screen uh, plugged into uh, our core uh, server. Uh, there are three main blocks. There is the screen designer, the logic builder, and then the connected uh, devices. Uh, on the screen designer, um, we have here an empty 
16 by 9 screen and it's very much drag and drop. So if I want a clock, I can drag on a clock and I can simply resize that which way I want. It comes with a lot of different styles. So if I load these styles here and I want a, a nice white clock like that one, you know, we can change it around. If I want to give it a bezel, we can drag on a bezel. Now I have a bezel and again, within the bezel, I can start changing styles. So if I, for example, want um, you know, a bezel like that, I have a bezel like that. So very, very flexible, very easy to work. There's a whole range of different uh, elements you can drag on and with lots of different properties from analog clocks to digital uh, clocks to a different style of digital clocks, dates, uh, cue lights, buttons, text boxes, uh, images. The really nice thing about this uh, is that if you have an, uh, an in-house department that looks after your color schemes, that looks after your uh, fonts and logos and so on, they can almost design these screens because they're a visual part of the studio. Within Photoshop or whatever they are using, they can say, here is what a 16 by 9 screen should look like. The clock should be this size, use this backdrop. Uh, we want this font, we want a button to look like this and so on. So a graphics person can completely design that and we can then import that very easily. So an example here is if I wanted to change the background, because I have no background set at the moment, I can just literally choose, for example, here a gray style background, and I've now loaded up this, I don't know, marble effect uh, background, but that could be anything. We can upload any JPEGs, PNGs straight into the system, and then they'll be available for uh, dropping, uh, dropping on. Um, for example, if I wanted to drop on an image, uh, I can now change that and I can say, actually, I want it to be, for example, this date text. And now we have this date text in the exact font that you want and you can really lay it out in a very, very nice way. Uh, we can also drag on things like um, a web browser. That could be a small part of a web browser, so that could be, um, you know, your TV station's web browser or radio station's web browser, or that could be full screen. And as we've seen before in the demonstration, we can switch between them. So there could be one screen, which is a full screen web browser, one screen, which is a full screen video, and one which is a production style screen. So you can switch between them uh, dynamically. Um, we've got the countdowns, production timers. Um, we can drag on videos. So if I wanted to have a video uh, in this corner like we have there, we can do that. Uh, and we can even drag on some uh, audio bars. So if I wanted to have some audio bars to show, you know, whether there's any audio going on within that video clip, then again, uh, we can do that. Um, very easy and very flexible to make uh, screen layouts. Once we've made our screen layout and we've saved it, uh, we can play in the logic builder. Um, the logic builder, again, is a drag and drop style uh, builder. What we have here is the logic map for touch screen. So every single one is there. And if I zoom in, for example, on this area here, uh, the first thing we have is the first screen, the home screen of our touch screen. On the left hand side, we have all the inputs that control it. So for example, um, is mic live on? Is the on air light on? What is the start of the clock? Is it analog? Is it digital? So all of those things that we design the screen designer as inputs control those elements will be available there. On the right hand side we have outputs like for example tap button one has been pressed, tap button two has been pressed and so on and we can uh, connect them uh, pretty easily. Um, we have a whole set of toolboxes on the, on the left so we have a, a new screen layout as you can see here we have multiple screen layouts but we also have logic elements so for example if I wanted uh, to create some logic if this and this so typical AND gate um, you know, but not this, etc. We can build up our complete uh, logic uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and then there's a whole range of elements like text elements. So if a certain text box wants to come from a certain uh, place, uh, we can we can merge text. We can uh, you know take URL text. We can really chip play around with what text is being uh, displayed. We have all of the URL elements. So if we have a web page, we can there set what the URL will be. Uh, but we can also link it to our uh, more easy to use uh, content uh, manager. A whole lot of scheduling elements. So if, for example, you're um, putting in an XML, which is your schedule, you can start pulling out all the elements.
things and displaying those uh, and things like that. Um, if you love maths, you love this. Lots of numeric numerical elements. So, for example, you can add things, you can divide. Uh, you have thresholds. So, if you say if this number coming in is more than this, um, you know, then do this, uh, etc. Uh, we have the infrared uh, control elements. We have the DMX control elements. Uh, we can do lots of things manipulating color. You know, so what kind of color elements we send through DM DMX? We have media elements, so media players, uh, a URL to media box, so that's how we get an HTTP or an RTS finish screen in, things like that. And then we have uh, audio level elements as well, uh, so you can then bring those in, into the bar graphs and play around with it. Um, I think we've made it as easy as can be. Clearly, you have to understand the facility, you know, so you might want to work together with your own engineering department or, or with a system integrator to, to configure this uh, to its full extent. Once you've created one of those logic maps, you can then upload it to the connected devices. Um, what you'll see here as an example is we've labeled our three devices, which is our Remora, our touchscreen, and the core, um, as Studio One. Yeah. So the really nice thing is uh, you can also, for example, have Studio Two, which will run with exactly the same configuration uh, files. Uh, but for example, within the within Studio One on the touchscreen, we will have programmed it so that when you press touchscreen, the touchscreen on my live button, for example, in this case, that will send it to the Remora 4, but all within Studio One. So the same uh, configuration files in Studio Two will limit that to Studio Two. Clearly, you, you can go across studios, but by just specifying the tag location rather than a specific device. We can really share configuration files very easily, so we don't have to redevelop every single configuration file uh, every time. Um, I, for example, selected the Remora 4 here. If I wanted to change the logic map um, to, for example, this one here, um, I just press OK, screen goes blank, and now I've loaded the new uh, logic map. Yeah, so a very easy process to change uh, logic maps, so back to where we were, and it picks up automatically uh, where we uh, left off. Um, so a very, very simple uh, setup, very, very powerful. Um, on the case of redundancy, because very often these things will um, form a critical part of that broadcast chain, so if you have lots of news arrival screens or automation readouts or things like that, uh, you know, queue lamps and stuff, these are important parts to uh, our workflow and to production. Um, we have a great level of built-in redundancy uh, on an IP level. We use something called cluster logic. So rather than the core calculating everything and sending everything to all the different screens, the intelligence built into the remoras or into the touch screens is what actually calculates everything. So when I'm sending this trigger from my Live from the touch screen to the remora, the core will never see that. The core has access to that signal, but it will never get involved. There will be a direct point-to-point -point communication over the network. So very, very flexible uh, in that sense. So if you, for example, have a gallery with three screens, uh, you know, showing the same information because you want to be able to see it from wherever uh, in that gallery, uh, and should, for example, one IP connection get lost, the cable gets pulled out or whatever, the whole system will continue to work on the other ones. Uh, likewise, all of the functionality you see here, should the core get unplugged by accident or something like that, will continue uh, to work. The main job of the core, other than configuring and creating the screen designs, is to interface with third-party devices on a device driver uh, level. So when we're doing iNews, that will gather that information and then send it out. Uh, but again, it's possible to have a completely fully redundant uh, core. So you can have two cores which are intelligent, intelligently hard beating all the time, as everything else on the system. So we always know exact system health, and we can do a completely automatic uh, changeover. So redundancy is a very, very key part um, of the system. Very quickly, on the back here, we have a list of uh, our I.O. boxes. Yeah. So we have a 1U I.O. box, which is 32 GPI in and 32 GPI out, as well as a time code input. So if you have uh, an SPG within the facility, that's your main time. 
uh, we can actually use that as an MTP server based uh, on that time code. So that would definitely, uh, uh, generally speaking, live within the control room uh, next to the actual uh, core. And then we have a whole range of what we call squidlets, which are small little uh, IP-based power over Ethernet boxes. We have a three uh, GPIO expansion box, so if you want some local GPIO. We have infrared device control mentioned. We have a little NTP server, so if you have a smaller setup where you want to turn timecode into uh, NTP, you can do that without the squid. We have the timecode interfaces, as I mentioned, so two in or two out. A DMX lighting control one, uh, and then a final one, which is a little microphone interface, which you can do to either show bar graphs uh, or to alarm if you go over a certain level. So if the, you know, the, the DJ is playing too loud in the studio, you can warn off that kind of uh, stuff. So there's a whole range of building blocks, store, building blocks there. To finish off, I'll just quickly show you the, uh, the content manager. Uh, the content manager is the more user-friendly side uh, of the core, uh, and it's, it's the, the layer uh, that, is, that is accessible from any web browser, whether it's on your iPad uh, or on a PC or a Mac, uh, even a phone if you so wish, uh, and allows you to upload uh, different pieces uh, of video. Um, so, for example, if I select you know, this wonderful little animal here as a screenshot, I can now go into the content manager um, and I can edit that ingest point so it's called branding button 10 I choose a file so I'm going to make it into someone playing darts I can ingest it uploading it's now transcoding and it will just appear on the screen so it's a very, very easy way for uh, anyone non-technical to be able to change the look and feel of the system without having to really start reprogramming it, reconfiguring it. Uh, so that, that's a very, very powerful as aspect. Uh, and also, as you've seen, there is no scripting involved. We have not done any real coding. It's all drag and drop uh, and connect uh, to create uh, the complete uh, system. So very, very powerful. Um, very shortly, we're also launching in the very similar style to the content manager, a messenger application. Uh, what the messenger application uh, allows you to do is to send a message to a single screen, a group of screens, so maybe all the screens in Studio One, or all the screens in a facility. Um, you can schedule these, so you can say, next Sunday at 10.45 for half an hour, please show this message, and the message could be, uh, there's a fire alarm drill, don't worry, it's just a test. You know, so you can let people know without everyone frantically having to start sending out emails and s run around with clipboards and let you know. So again, it's a real efficiency uh, saving. Um, but it could also be a, a message into the green room where the talent who is about to come on air, you know, is told, you know, five minutes until you're up, and so you can communicate uh, in that way as well. So that would be a very, very nice addition to the system. And again, it's very, very easily accessible from a, a user level. Yeah, you can really control uh, which user with their login details has access to what to which areas. So maybe a certain person only has access to the screens in the green room. Yeah, so they can't just start sending messages to studios and galleries. They can only send a message to the green room to say, you're up in five minutes. Uh, you know, maybe facility-wise, they have access to everything that's outside of studios and galleries. So they can put on a message uh, you know, about whatever event uh, is happening. So you can really manage uh, that as well. So you can really protect certain areas from being taken taken off air um, you know, by someone who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing. So you can really manage that aspect as well. 